I want to thank Jeremy, first of all, for those outstanding songs that he selected and that he uh, led us in this morning. That first song that he led us in, it's almost like he was looking at my notes when he was choosing songs, because uh, that went with it perfectly. And uh, I had never heard that song before today. It's one of my new favorites. I can't wait to learn it a little bit better and to uh, sing it a little bit better my own self. The rest of you sounded good, but uh, I'm ready to try to make myself sound a little bit better with that. It's good to see those who are visiting with us. Good to have some of the uh, Jeremy's family with us, people that we love so very much and are no strangers to us here. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we pray that we've made you feel welcome. And I believe we probably did because this is a very friendly congregation. But if we did not before service, the service, please stay around a little bit afterwards and let us get to know you a little bit better. You will love these people and uh, we'll love getting to know you as well. Uh, get your Bibles. Go ahead and be turning to the book of Hosea. We'll be staying there the entire sermon, but we're going to be reading a lot this morning. And uh, you will get more out of this sermon if you're able to follow along with us as we read from this great book of the Bible. The book of Hosea, it's in the Old Testament. It's not one that we go to a whole lot. It's uh, one that might be difficult for you to find. Uh, it's on page 790 in my Bible. But I'll wait for you to get there because I want you to uh, follow along with me as we explore amazing love, the story of Hosea. And as we look about this text that we're going to read today, we're going to see three main points that are going to, going to present themselves to us uh, very plainly, I believe, if you study this book very much, of sin, judgment, and love. Those are the three things that we're going to see. But let's get our Bibles and turn with me to Hosea chapter 1. We're going to start with verses 2 and 3 and quickly just give a synopsis of the book. This will not do it justice, I, I know that, but kind of give us a quick synopsis of what this book is. Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord God said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Look at Hosea chapter 2 now, verse 2. We've already seen that she's he, that he is instructed to take a wife of harlotry, uh, who are children of whoredom. And we're going to see now in Hosea chapter 2, he goes and he rescues this woman from this horrible lifestyle and watch what takes place. She goes back to her whoredom and to her adultery and to her harlotry. Hosea chapter 2, look with me, verse 2. Bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Drop down to verses 4 and 5. I will not have mercy on her children, for they are the children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil, and my drink, drop down to verses 14 and 15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall sing there and in the days of her youth as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. So she goes back to her former life, back to her whoredom, back to her adultery and other practices. But look now at Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And we won't hit on this hard right now, but we're going to hit on it hard later. Then the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord God uh, for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raising cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. So get this. Here's the synopsis of the book. Uh, Hosea is instructed by God, you go and get a wife of the harlots, one who practices harlotry. You bring her out of that lifestyle. So he did this. She goes back into that former lifestyle. She leaves the safety from where she is and goes back to that horrible lifestyle. 
And then from there, Hosea is instructed, you have to go back now and buy her back from people who uh, she has attached herself to. All of this, as we see in Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, is a true illustration of what God has done for his people, the Israelites. And that's really the whole point of the book. Hosea is an illustration in Gomer of what Israel had done to God. Now that's a quick synopsis of the book. Now look at the final charge in Hosea chapter 14, verse 9. Hosea chapter 14, verse 9, where it says, Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. What do the righteous walk in? They walk in the ways of the Lord. So the questions that we have to ask and answer today, if I want to walk in the ways of the Lord and not stumble in them, then here's the things I need to know. What are the ways of the Lord so that I can walk in them. This was the challenge to the Israelites, begging their attention, begging them to heed the warning. Who is wise? Who is prudent? Well, those who listen to the warning, the ways of the Lord are right. So then what are the ways of the Lord? To answer the challenge and declaration of the book of Hosea, we need to ask God, what are your ways? So that we can walk in them today. Here's the message of Hosea that we're going to see. Number one, God's attitude toward sin, God's judgment of sin, and then God's love for man. There's our three points. Let's first of all notice, what does Hosea teach concerning sin? Go back to Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We're going to look at this passage quite a bit because this is one that I think is just... Amazing. I know that doesn't do it justice, but let's just call it that. Hosea chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 again. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love the raising cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. And I said to her, You will stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. What does Hosea teach concerning sin? Here it is. And this is what I want us to really remember from this lesson today. The sin of a people of high privilege is the worst of which humanity is capable. And I, I don't jump too far ahead of me. Don't start thinking what's he mean by that. We're going to paint it out a little bit more in detail. But suffice it to say for this first point, the sin of a people of high privilege is the worst of which humanity is capable. Look at Hosea chapter 6 verse 9 where it says, As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man till the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Have you noticed that some horrible sins are just barely mentioned in passing almost in the book of Hosea. Here's murder. He doesn't really key in on this. It's mentioned here just kind of in passing, but there's other things that he, that he really, really hammers on. And, and he does this to show us this first point. The sin of a people of high privilege is the worst of which humanity is capable. And this is exactly what Judah was. This was the sin of Judah. These were the people of the highest privilege on earth. Now you might be thinking I'm talking about money. That's not what I'm talking about. You might be thinking I'm talking about prosperity. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a people who knew the law of God. They knew the love of God. They knew what, what he meant uh, to them or what he should mean to him. They, they know what God had done for them, not only in their present time, but throughout all of the history of the Israelites. They knew this. This describes them, a people of high privilege. God had loved them. He lavished his love upon them. And they answered that love with what? infidelity. And didn't it start almost right away with Aaron and the golden calf? These are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. Time and time again, God rescues these people. And how do they repay his love? With infidelity. And as we said, certain vulgar terms are really uh, mentioned and dealt with in, in, in detail. But then there's others that are hardly referred to, such as murder. But deeper down than any of these sins, look at Hosea chapter 11, starting with verse 1. Deeper
deeper down than any of these sins, which are mentioned in passing, is that of infidelity to love. When Israel was a child, man, let this sink in. I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. What's he doing? He's going back to their history. Going back to their history. When they were in, in Egypt, when they were in bondage, I called out my son. Get, get the words that he calls them. My child, my son. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense, carved images. I brought them out of here. I brought my children out of here. Out of my deep love for them, I rescued. I heard, you remember Exodus tells us, I heard the cry from their affliction. So I went in and I rescued them. What did they do? They went after these false idols. Look at verse 3. I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Don't miss the verbiage in here. What did he do? I taught Ephraim to walk. Do you think of anything more tender than that? Some of you still have young children. A lot of us had young children at one time. And you remember when you were trying to teach them to walk? What did you do? Some of the first steps that you do, and without making a fool of myself up here, you would hold their hands in front of you and you'd walk like a duck on each side of them, holding their little hands in your hands, teaching them how to walk until finally they were able to walk on their own. There's nothing more tender than that. And that's the picture God paints of what he did for his children. I taught you to walk. I drew you not with vengeful cords, not with hateful cords, but with gentle cords. Did I lead you? And what did you do? They were a people whom God had talked, taught to walk, taking them in his arms and loved them with a love surpassing anything they had ever imagined. But in spite of all of this, they became unfaithful to their father. Hosea learned the heart of God on a personal basis by that of his own broken heart. His own home life was destroyed. And he had passed through this intolerable agony created not by what he had done, but by what his unfaithful wife had done to him and his house. And through this experience, Hosea truly learned what sin really means and what it does to our father. To describe the sin in the book of Hosea, he adopts the vulgar words of adultery and harlotry. Adultery, as we know, is seeking satisfaction in unlawful relations. Harlotry is worse in our imagery, at least, because not only is it doing that, but it's the sin of prostituting high possessions for the sake of hiring gain. What's the difference? Adultery seeking satisfaction in unlawful relations. But what is harlotry? Harlotry is having these high prized possessions and forfeiting them, giving them away for your own selfish satisfaction. That's what harlotry is. That's what prostitution is. If we really think about it, what is it? It's a woman giving up the dignity with which she is created and seeking that she gives it all away to get something that she desires. That's what harlotry is, and that's what Judah had done. They had it all. But what did they do? They sacrificed on the altar of pleasure, gave it away to gain the things that they thought were more valuable to them. God had met them. God had loved them. He had taught them to walk. He had carried them in his arms. And they sold and gave away all of that to go after these false gods. 
And when we think about what this did to Hosea, we're demanded by studying this book to understand what sin does to our God. That's what Hosea teaches concerning sin. You ever think as you sin, well, I shouldn't do this. Why? Well, because the Bible says I shouldn't. And if I do that, then I go against the Bible. And, and that's, that's nothing wrong with that type of thinking. But when I read the book of Hosea, I really truly understand how devastating sin is, not just to myself, but to the heart of my God. And when I start thinking about it in those terms, it hits home even harder, doesn't it? Let's look in the second place of God's judgment. Of sin. Oftentimes we hear about big sins and little sins. And there is a sense in which any distinction of sin is completely unwarranted. Sin is sin, and we understand that. There's no such thing as a little sin and a big sin. Sin is sin. Sin will uh, be responsible for condemning your soul. But there's another sense that I want us to think about this, and it has more to do with consequence than it does actually the sin itself. But there is another sense in which it is true. If we took the national outlook, which Hosea is taking, the sin of a privilege of a privileged people is far more terrible. Again, not necessarily in, in what it does to our soul, but, but truly just the consequences of it than that of a people who have no privilege. The sin of a people of privilege is far more condemning, far more consequential than a people who have no privilege. The shining of light always creates responsibility. Israel had had God as her husband, and now she leaves him for another. What was it that distinguished Gomer from all the other women from her hometown that were involved in the same harlotry that she was involved in? What distinguished her from them? What distinguished her from them was that she was taken by a man who treated her like a queen, who loved her like a queen, who provided for her, who gave her her dignity back. But what's the difference between her and everybody else? She had all of that in her grasp, but what did she do with it? She threw it in his face. She goes back to what she used to do. What's the difference? Those women who did just what Gomer had done never knew what it was like to have a good life for a little while. How does God judge sin? Sin is sin, as we've said. The friends... People who have a high privilege have a tougher way to go when they turn back to sin. Don't take my word for it. Let's look at the Bible. What's the worst sin? 2 Peter chapter 2, 20 through 22. For if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse than them at the beginning. What's that? They were in sin. They came out of sin, then they went back into sin. So why is it worse when they go back into sin? Well, listen to it. For if they had it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Think about this. Israel had had God as her husband and now leaves him for another. How many Gentiles would have loved to have had the opportunity that Israel had, that Israel just threw away? And then we read this. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. I want you to listen very carefully and I want this to really sink in deeply to how privileged we are. But with that privilege comes a responsibility. Let me say this and then let me prove it. Number one, if you don't plan on being faithful to the Lord, 
it would be better for you not to be here today. If you don't plan on being faithful to the Lord, it would be better for you never to have heard the gospel call. It would have been better for you to never hear a single sermon. Better for you if your parents had not instilled in you God's word, not brought you up according to his word. It would have been better for you never to even have heard the name of God than to have heard it, obeyed it, and ignored it. Why? What's the difference? The difference is People of a high privilege will have eternity to remember what they once had but gave away, sold, and went back into the world. One of the worst things that I've seen, and I've made this mistake myself, going to foreign countries, third world countries, fourth world countries, and showing pictures of the house that we live in, the cars that we drive, the clothes that we have, because they don't realize how poor they are until they see what we've got. And then they start missing those things that they never knew existed. You see, you expose them to a little bit of the West and they start craving that and they miss what they don't have. It's what it is to be a privileged person who has heard the gospel of Christ. We know, at least we should know, the opportunity provided to us to obey the gospel of Christ. And just to refuse it, you're going to have a harder judgment because you know. I'm so thankful for this last point. God makes a way back to him. Look at Hosea chapter 13, or chapter 3 rather. We've read this, I think, at least the third time now. We're going to read it one more time. Hosea chapter 3. God made and makes a way back to him. Then the Lord said to me, go again. This is after all of this had happened. If you read the book of Hosea, you see that Gomer is just in a horrible, horrible condition. Those people that she sold herself uh, back into that condition have now forsaken her um, she has to beg to get by. She's treated like dirt. A horrible, horrible condition that she finds herself in. And it's in this context that we read Hosea chapter 3. The Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery. Just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. Now look at verse 2. So I bought her for myself. Stop right there. To be honest, this is the part of the book that just angers me. What, what do you mean you had to go buy your own wife who chose to leave you, who chose to go to this condition, to, to these conditions, that chose to be with other men, and you have to go buy her back? Something is wrong with that. That's not justice. We watch cowboy movies because the good guys always win at the end. Hosea's losing. He's done nothing but good. His wife is the problem. And now he has to sacrifice to go and buy her back. That angers me. Because he's innocent. And then we read on. And I'm bothered even more. I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half omers of barley. And I said to her, here we go. 
This is where I'm going to start to be made to feel a little bit better for what he has to do. What would you say to her? You rescue her from this. You take her as a wife. You give her dignity back that she's had for the first time since she was a child. She has that all back. She forfeits all of that. She runs away to the arms of other men. And now you have to go back and you have to buy her back. And what would be the first words out of your mouth? Woman, let me tell you how it's going to be. From now on, you do everything I tell you to do. I'll treat you any way I want to treat you. And you'll just be glad to be here, lady. That's how it's going to be. And at the first sign that you aren't grateful to me, you're right out the door. Take it or leave it. But that's how it's going to be. Now, thinking humanly, that's what the rest of this verse ought to say. Well, what does it say? I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. Watch this now. And so too will I be toward you. Forget about what happened in the past. Honey, you be faithful to me. I'll be faithful to you. You treat me kindly. And I'll treat you kindly. Aren't you glad it says that? And then these words, the most beautiful ever written. I will heal their backsliding. Watch it. I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. You want to see the heart of God? There it is. I will heal their backsliding. Thank God. I will love them freely. Thank God. My anger has turned away. Thank God. Can you hear the anthem from the heart of God? How? How can you love Israel after all they did to you? How? Hosea, how can you love this woman again, have this attitude toward her after all that she had done to you? How? And to be quite honest, it, it somewhat angers me that they're going to away with it scot-free. There needs to be punishment. They need to be made to feel bad. There needs to be continually that reminder of Gomer, what you did to your husband Israel, what you did to God until... I realize who the main character in the account of Hosea is and who Gomer is. And then I hit my knees and I thank God that his heart is not like mine because I'm Gomer. In this book. And is this not exactly. What our God. Has done for each of us. When you were a child. You were innocent. You left that innocence for sin. And you left your father but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were sinners. Christ died for us. He bought you back 
with a price. You had it all. You threw it in his face. But God commended his love toward us. And that he bought you back. And when he bought you back, it's none of this, all right, I'll let you come back. But every day I want you to be reminded of how horrible you are, what horrible things you've done, how much you don't deserve what I've done for you. None of that. I will remember their sins no more. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed their sins from them. Are you faithful to God? Are you faithful to him? After knowing what he has done for you, are you faithful to him? Are you faithful? What will you do if you are in the state that Gomer found herself in and you've been reminded today of what Christ did to buy you back? If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, what will you do? You believe with all your heart Jesus Christ died for you, that he loves you. Will you repent of the sins that put him on the cross? Will you confess your faith in Christ? Will you be baptized into him to have your sins washed away? To have them washed away. That's how he provides a way back. Through the waters of baptism. So your sins can be washed. He'll never hold them against you anymore. He'll take you back just as if you had never committed the first sin. Would you like that today? Or if you did obey the gospel of Christ. You are that highly privileged person. But you've not been living as you should. What will you do? What will you do? We can help you in any way. We're going to sing a song of invitation. We're going to be led in. And during that song, if you feel the need for the prayers of the church, if you want to make your life right, if we can help you in any way. Come and have a seat in the front pews and we'll take care of that need. He's ready to take you back. He's ready. Won't you run?